How's it going, folks? In this mini lecture, we are continuing with our theme of contesting colonial legacies. Here I want to cover Toipurina and the Spanish mission system. So first of all, who exactly is Toipurina? A little bit about her, as uh, for those of you who may not be too familiar with her, she is a popular uh, figure in invoking indigenous resistance among California's uh, indigenous peoples. And uh, a little bit about her, as of course, as it mentions in this uh, mural here, it says here that Toipurina was an indigenous Tongva medicine woman who was native to California and led a rebellion against the San Gabriel mission. Uh, and the bottom left here, also another commemoration of her. Uh, this is from an, an image I found on the internet uh, where someone writes, LA natives in 1785, a Tongva medicine woman leads a revolt against Spanish missionaries who forbid native practices her name is Toipurina. So here we're going to talk a little bit about her, uh, her legacy and her role in the fights against the San Gabriel uh, missionaries, I'm sorry, in her, in her battle against the San Gabriel mission. So what exactly were the missions and what do we know about the missions in myth and in memory? Uh, so previously, uh, it, missions were celebrated in California history as this sort of place where natives came to willingly convert to Christianity, supposedly. And you've probably heard of some of these romantic histories that usually ignored the realities of violence, sexual abuse, and death that occurred here at the missions. Uh, as far as what the purpose of the missions were, they were these small Catholic religious communities, and they were usually overseen by missionaries who were part of the mendicant orders. These were the mendicant orders that were in charge of converting the natives to Christianity. And so there were many groups of them, and they were not considered officially part of the Catholic Church. Uh, but these missionaries were known as the groups of the Fran the Order of the Franciscans, the Dominicans, and the Order of the Jesuits. Uh, for the Spanish Empire, they used the missions in northern Mexico as colonies, and uh, these uh, missions essentially served as colonies that, uh, um, well, they were seen as necessary since many parts of northern Mexico um, were they were being claimed by the Spanish Empire. But the problem was that there were not many Spanish subjects who actually lived there. Uh, and so the missions would be key in populating the present day southwestern U.S. region in states like California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, and Texas. And so these colonies, they were set up by Catholic missionaries and uh, exactly who lived there uh, were not only included them, but also Spanish soldiers. And there were also indigenous peoples, mestizos, and mulatto colonists who came from other parts of Mexico that had already previously been colonized by the Spanish and were converted to Christianity. And uh, even after setting up these missions, the Spanish, the indigenous mestizo and mulatto colonists, they were still a minority group compared to the indigenous populations that were natives of these regions in the Mexican, what was then the Mexican North. And uh, these Catholic missionaries, uh, for them, they, uh, it didn't matter to them that their numbers were low. For them, what they mostly cared about was that uh, that they would use these missions to spread Christianity. And also uh, they were more concerned with inviting the local indigenous groups to become part of their of these mission communities. And what we will learn is that some missionaries were actually more aggressive than others uh, in their duties or in their mission to convert natives to Christianity. And again, this led to numerous indigenous uprising against the missions in subsequent years. So let's uh, let's start off with a brief history of the missions. The earliest missions were set up in the northern Mexican region during the 1540s uh, in the regions of Nueva Vizcaya and Sonora. And as the Spaniards continued to push further north and create more missions, they were strongly opposed by groups like the Tepehuanes, the Tarahumaras, the Hopis, and the Sunnis. But uh, instead of fighting the Spanish, some of these groups just moved elsewhere to avoid being bothered by the Spanish missionaries and soldiers. Uh, there's a good work on this, by the way, by uh, historian Susan Deeds, uh, D Defiance and Deference. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, from the 1540s up until the 1640s, missionaries in Sinaloa, Sonora, Durango, Chihuahua, New Mexico, they managed to get some of the local indigenous groups to adopt mission life. Examples of some of the earliest converts to, uh, in the missions are the Mayos, the Yaquis, the Pimas, the Opatas, uh, and also the Pueblos uh, in the New Mexico region. Um, however, a problem was that these missionaries demanded that the indigenous peoples who came to these missions, they demanded them to abandon uh, their religions. And so, of course, this would cause later conflict. 
And so that's exactly what happened. Uh, these demands for them to get rid of their religions sparked the Tepewan religious leaders to call for a violent rebellion against the Jesuit missionaries from 1616 to 1618. Uh, and in the process of the Tepewan rebellion, they killed many Jesuits and they forced them to abandon their missions there and relocate uh, elsewhere. And after two years of fighting, uh, at, soon afterwards, the Tepewanes were violently reconquered. And after they were conquered, they were forced to go back to these missions. So the threats that these missionaries posed on native religions, uh, this would also provoke later uprisings such as the infamous Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Uh, and uh, the problem in, uh, in th that, uh, the problems that, that stem from the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 was that the indigenous peoples living in these missions dealt with more just than just religious opposition to their beliefs and customs. The Pueblos, for example, they also protested, you know, the, uh, the exploitative uh, labor conditions. You know, they also were uh, responsible for cultivating the mission lands. They also had to build churches. They were the ones who tended the cattle and did the chores uh, while, while they were in the missions. And they did all of this without being compensated. Additionally, many of these folks were forced to work for the Spaniards who had ordered them to collect resources for them. Uh, so the pueblos had to collect their salt, nuts, and other goods. And to make matters worse, many of the pueblos ended up dying uh, during epidemics and diseases that were introduced by the Spaniards. Further agitating the pueblos was that the Franciscans had launched an anti-idolatry campaign in the 1660s. And so during this anti-idolatry anti campaign, uh, they had prohibited the pueblos from dancing their, their sacred dances. They raided their ceremonial spaces and they destroyed ceremonial objects. They also punished the pueblos who violated these rules with corporal punishments uh, and also with whippings. And so soon the Pueblo natives would uh, eventually unite uh, under the vision of Pope, uh, and they successfully kicked out the Spanish during the 1680 Pueblo revolt. And notably, right, this was a successful indigenous resistance. They actually managed to keep the Spaniards out for at least 10 years. But uh, later, of course, they would soon be reconquered again uh, in a violent reconquest campaign, just like the Tetawanes. Now, before I continue talking about the missions and the uprisings, it's important to also acknowledge that there were some indigenous people who did embrace life in the missions. Uh, an example is the Piro Pueblos, who they were the folks who had followed the Spaniards when the Spaniards were kicked out during the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. And, you know, and although there is a tendency by some folks who refer to these indigenous peoples as so-called sellouts or such, again, we do have to keep in mind that there were benefits of mission life to some of these people. We also under, have to understand, you know, that this was why some preferred to live their life in the missions. Uh, so for starters, on the one hand, the missions did offer a way of life that uh, offered safety from the Spaniards. And this is an important point brought in Alan Knight's book on uh, colonial Mexico. Uh, so again, uh, life in the missions meant that, uh, of course, you were no longer subject to being raided by the Spanish. Uh, and also, you know, you were not a victim of their military expedition. So in this case, right, uh, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, and um, especially considering, you know, that the Spaniards had much more destructive weapons. Uh, you know, they had access to guns, horses, uh, and, uh, and steel, steel weaponry. Uh, also, another thing, thing to keep in mind was that life in the mission did offer a degree of economic security, right? So for those who lived there, this meant that they had some housing, some food, clothing, and access to uh, purchase, purchasing Spanish goods from central Mexico. And uh, the missions also did give some of these folks a sense of political autonomy there, right? So they, there was some political participation that was allowed among the indigenous folks who lived there. So they could elect local alcaldes and town authorities in places in the missions in Sonora and in Sinaloa. So then what were some of the problems of mission life? So for starters, some of the problems with the mission life was that natives had to comply with the rules that were set by Catholic religious officials who did not tolerate disobedience. And they often punished them through whippings and public humiliation. And in some cases, indigenous people who came to the missions were not always aware that they were expected to stay there. And some who tried to later leave the missions were hunted down by Spanish troops and brought back 
uh, to the missions against their will. Some also suffered physical and sexual abuse from both religious authorities and Spanish soldiers. Ferreras treated them like, quote, perpetual children in their writings and often referred to them as if they were children. The natives were also expected to carry out labor tasks without monetary compensation. You know, natives built churches, they tilled the fields, they raised cattle, they harvested crops, they performed domestic services needed to keep the mission running. And uh, another problem was that uh, when disease outbreaks occurred, uh, disease was rampant. Uh, and again, keeping in mind that you're concentrating people who usually, who had previously lived in very sparse uh, areas or that they lived in conditions where they were sparsely populated. Uh, and so these scattered rancherias now became, uh, you know, concentrated. Now this, uh, this meant that these folks who were, who were once spread out now had an increased risk, uh, an increased risk of exposure uh, to diseases such as smallpox, measles, and typhus. Uh, and in the 1690s, when the Spaniards created the first missions among the Texas peoples in present day East Texas, uh, as an example of this disease spreading, uh, the Tejas warned the missionaries to leave later on since they correctly identified, right, that the Spaniards and their allies, uh, they saw that they were responsible for provoking the small out, uh, smallpox uh, outbreaks that killed many of them. And so given these factors, it's no surprise that during the major uprisings like the Pueblo Revolt in 1680, that indigenous rebels specifically targeted and destroyed the missions uh, after these outbreaks occurred or after these abuses occurred, they specifically targeted the missions. So the colonization of Arizona, Sonora, and the Californias with the use of mission settlements occurred much later in contrast to the, uh, the setting up of missions in Texas and in Mexico, right? Or I should say Texas and New Mexico. Uh, and uh, so the earliest efforts begins in 1687 when El Sub, El Sub Eusebio Quino, I'm probably mispronouncing that, he oversaw the creation of the first Jesuit missionaries, uh, missions, I should say, I'm sorry, in Arizona and in Sonora. And 10 years later, in 1697, the Jesuits began to create missions in Baja California. But just like other missions, the indigenous uprisings to the mission life occurred, and they were also put down violently by Spanish troops. In 1734, the Periques had revolted against the Jesuit priests, but they were later put down by soldiers who were sent by the Sinaloa governor, Manuel Idobro, two years later. What about the colonization of Alta California? Alta California, Alta California of course, refers to present-day California, uh, or the region, right, that includes present-day California, I should say, uh, more, more correctly. Uh, so the missionization and colonization of this region began in 1768, and it was led by a Gaspar de Portola, who was the governor of Baja California, and also the infamous Fray Junipero Serra, the Franciscan guardian of the Baja California missions. But uh, just like the missions in other parts of no northern Mexico, the missions here were populated by soldiers, Franciscans, and Christianized natives. And in this case, they were accompanied by indigenous peoples from Baja California. And uh, these first settlements, however, they were not just missions, but also presidios. Uh, there were also uh, these fortresses that were set up uh, in San Diego and also in Monterrey Bay. Uh, and by the year 1800, the Franciscans established 25 missions in Alta California. However, the California missions also were places where native customs were suppressed. Uh, abuse uh, was also rampant there, and epidemics also led to the decimation of indigenous populations. Uh, so this brings us to the story of Toipurina, who helped to plan one of the infamous indigenous uprisings against the Spanish colonizers in Alta California. Uh, still, this event did not turn out like the Pueblo Revolt uh, in 1680, since the plot was actually discovered and led to Toipurina's arrest and her uh, interrogation. Um, and so we'll get to this uh, in just a bit. So uh, let's begin by talking about this document, uh, the assigned document that revol revolts at the San Gabriel mission. Uh, for those of you who read this document, um, this is a, what we would consider a primary source document, uh, right? Because it's one of these official accounts of the revolt at the San Gabriel mission. Uh, it contains not only the interrogation of Toipurina, but it also has the interrogation of some of her co-conspirators. 
Uh, and so a little bit of background on the document. Uh, again, uh, this is from October 25th, 1785. Uh, and this is a collection of a transcription and translation of the judicial pr proceedings of this event. Uh, as rec uh, it's, uh, of course, translated, uh, transcribed by Rose Marie uh, Beebe uh, and Robert M. Senkwitz. I'm sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that also. Uh, and these folks are from Santa Clara University. Uh, so this testimony here, it's considered a primary source document as they state in the introduction, uh, the, uh, the originals of these documents are actually kept at two different archives. Uh, the first set of documents here, uh, the Provincias Internas document, uh, it contains the interrogation that was kept at the National Archive of, uh, at Mexico City, uh, otherwise known as the Archivo General de la Nación. If any of y'all actually happen to uh, go to Mexico City uh, and are looking for awesome places to eat, stay, hit me up. Uh, I've done research at the AGN many years and it's one of my favorite places to do research nonetheless. Um, the latter set of documents uh, is ca uh, called here the California Mission Documents, which they describe their sentencing and are kept at the Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library. Um, and so in this testimony, we learned that Doi Purina, along with uh, A. Nicolas Jose, that they are disgruntled with the missionaries for various reasons, which I will try to summarize in this presentation. Uh, notably, what's interesting when we're reading the interrogations is that we might get a sense that the rebels being interrogated are providing information strategically, and maybe they might be withholding some information that could potentially have led them to suffer much harsher punishment. But uh, before talking a little bit about this interrogation, what exactly happened? So uh, we learned, first of all, about Nicolas Jose. Uh, Nicolas Jose wants to organize an uprising uh, at the San Gabriel Mission, and we learned that he, based on this interrogation, I'm just summarizing, that he recruited Toipurina to spread word about the uprising, and we also learned that she was very successful at doing so. Uh, and according to these documents, um, I'm sorry, uh, according to these documents, her role in this uprising was apparently to cast a death spell uh, or some sort of conjuring on the two Catholic missionaries who were there. Uh, and afterwards that the Purina's allies, uh, after they confirmed that the two missionaries were dead, that it would uh, they would use this as a signal to begin their uprising and to attack the Spanish soldiers. Uh, however, in practice, somehow the Ferris learned about the plot. Uh, and on the day of the planned revolt, the Ferris played dead as the indigenous rebels entered uh, the mission. Um, and instead, the supposedly dead priest signaled for the Spanish soldiers to come and arrest all of these conspirators. And so this led to the subsequent trial that's listed uh, in this uh, document. Uh, and so the, the document itself also contains uh, the, uh, the testimonies of these four witnesses uh, who are, again, I might be butchering these. Uh, there's Deme Hasakuichi, Toipurina, Achiyivi, and Nicolas Jose. Um, and so uh, eventually this leads to the arrest and trial of these four leaders and their testimonies, of course, outlined in this document. Um, one thing that I am going to say here, uh, though, and if there's any colonialists out there listening, um, what's not clear is if whether or not these testimonies were gathered under torture. I'm not sure. I, I don't get a sense of that. Um, or uh, it does, Usually it will tell you in the document. Uh, but uh, I wanted to point out that this was often a common practice in, uh, in colonial Spanish jurisprudence. I don't know if by this time that's a practice that's no longer common or if that's not being implemented in California. But I just wanted to point out that if torture is a factor here, this should also make us question some of the testimony that was provided. Okay, and so I'm not going to cover the entirety of the uh, of the interrogations. I expect you all to read this on your own, uh, but uh, I wanted to skip to the last part uh, of this document, which is the verdict. So we learned that they're all found guilty and they're all ordered to receive 25 lashes, which meant that they were whipped uh, along with those who supported them. Uh, they were also meant to be whipped in public. And why was it that they were supposed to be whipped in public? Well, the, the document states that, quote, this punishment will be carried out in the presence of everyone so as to serve as a warning to all. They will receive from me the most serious reprimands regarding their lack of gratitude. I will reproach them for their wickedness, and I will show them how they were tricked into allowing themselves to be controlled by the women whose cunning acts have no power against those of us who are Catholics. 
So interesting, right? You get a sense here that uh, part of the reason why this was a public whipping was, of course, not only to spread terror, but also to make Doipurina uh, uh, right into an example. Uh, and here they uh, they distinctly single her out, right, as a sort of this wicked woman uh, and uh, this cunning woman at, at that. <laughs> Interestingly, in the sent uh, in the sentencing document, we also see an example of how Spanish colonists. Uh, had used what uh, the his, uh, what Jose Rabasa refers to as love speech, and so there's a really good book on this. Uh, his, he has a text called "Writing Violence on the Northern Frontier." Uh, and, um, anyways, one thing that he says about love speech this is on page six to seven of his book listed here. He says that love speech, unlike hate speech, it was used in Spanish col colonial legal codes to sort of convey this idea that they wanted a, a peaceful conquest. Uh, however, right, this language implied or hid the fact that violence was still being used uh, at a symbolic level. And in this case, uh, the whippings here are described as a necessary punishment that is uh, at least not as bad as giving them the death sentence. And as it mentions here, quote on page 22 of the document, uh, on the transcription, I should say, uh, with these and other appropriate admonitions, they will be set free with the precautionary warning that the slightest indication that they are reverting to their previous behavior will not be tolerated. We will make them understand that they are being punished with moderation, out of compassion and love we have for them. So again, end quote, that is a example of the sort of love, colonialist love speech. And now what about Doi Purina's sentencing? So we learned some interesting details about her sentencing and her life after the revolt. Uh, one would assume that she received that she would receive the harshest punishment, not only for helping to lead the uprising, but also because she faced charges of witchcraft. But uh, according to the documents, we learned that she was spared from a much harsher punishment because she told the interrogators that she wanted to become a neophyte, which referred to someone who was a newly converted Christian. Uh, and so the document states that some of the indigenous peoples who participated in the, in the uprising also wanted to kill her, and uh, it says that it's because they were they were angry that they were tricked. But what's unclear in the document here that I wasn't sure about myself uh, is that uh, it's unclear if the document implies that they were angry that they were tricked into following her, or were they or were they uh, or were they angry because they felt they were tricked because the Fres were not actually dead, or were they angry that their uprising was a failure and therefore seen as a trick, right? So. Unfortunately, I can't say for sure what the implication is here, without a doubt. Uh, but nevertheless, right, uh, you get a sense that they, whatever the trickery was, they were mad at Doi Purina. Uh, but perhaps to save her life, we learn that she's ordered to, uh, to be exiled, to go far away from the San Gabriel mission in order to avoid death. And it says here that she was, uh, she was to be sent to either San Antonio, Texas, or to Santa, Santa Clara in Northern California. Uh, she was also baptized as Maria Regina uh, after this event, uh, whereas Nicolas Jose, on the other hand, he was sent to, uh, to six years of hard labor. But uh, although originally he was so, supposed to be sent far away, but he was kept in the San Gabriel mission so that he could be close to his family. So uh, nevertheless, right, although there is some myth and some uh, some debate, right, concerning the actual role of Doipurina and uh, in the San Gabriel mission. Nevertheless, right, uh, what's important is that this, uh, that her story does stand as a testament, as a legacy, right, of indigenous re resistance to the missions uh, in Alta California and in Baja California as well. Um, and we also learn here that it was not just men, right, who participated in acts of native resistance. Women definitely played key roles as well. For that matter, right, we learned that Doi Purina was very much key in organizing uh, a large following uh, and just kind of briefly going over what's mentioned here uh, in her um, in her interrogation. In her interrogation, she says that she admits to ordering Teme Hasakwichi to persuading the natives to stop believing the Catholic fathers and to instead believe her. Uh, her testimony also gives her, um, also, it also, she also tells us the motive for why she decided to lead this uprising. Uh, and evidently, this was so that she could counteract the Spanish colonization of her homeland. You know, in this document, the scribe, the, the scribe, I'm sorry, uh, the scribe famously writes that, quote, she advised him, Demaha Sakwichi, to do this because she was angry with the fathers and with all the others at this mission 
because we are living on their land, end quote. Uh, so that's a very famous uh, quote from this document that uh, has been put onto murals, by the way. And it's also thanks to her influence that uh, we learned that she succeeded in encouraging six other rancherias or villages to also fight. Uh, but she does say that Nicolas Jose was the first to bring the chiefs together. But nevertheless, right, I mean, the fact that she encouraged six other rancherias to fight six other entire villages, right, says something about her influence. And um, uh, we also learn about other things as well, right, that she also, um, that uh, we also learned a little bit about Nicolas Jose, who was another actor uh, in this uh, in this uprising. We learned that he had not only played a key role in this uprising, but uh, also that he also ordered the, the, the theft of land and, and cattle uh, from the Spanish. And uh, we learned in some of the other accounts that some of the indigenous folks did, it, of course, carry out those uh, those thefts and even killings of cattle. Um, but anyways, that's it for now for this mini lecture. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, I will see you all in the coming weeks. Thank you.